This is it, the second annual Mighty Marvel Convention on, on April 23rd, 24th, and 25th in New York City. This is Stan Lee talking, and you are there. Now, I'll shut up and give you a chance to see what was happening. We start off with me signing autographs after making a speech. Here we go. Is Cassell running for governor? He wants to run for governor. He wants to dictate. That's a better job. <laughs> she wants the president to leave. It's not that strong. I, I got a few votes in the last presidential election at some colleges. It was funny, you know, some kids gave some write-in votes. I think I got 23 votes. It wasn't quite enough to carry the nation. Are you thinking of a live Spider-Man series? A lot? Oh, yes. Yes, we are. Can you, can you tell me what you're doing today? Are you, where are you today? Uh, this is the second annual Marvel Comic Con. This is the second year I've been here. Okay, you having a good time? I'm having a fantastic time. This is what I live for. You read Marvel comics, I take it? I read all kinds of comics, but mostly Marvel. Yeah, they're my favorites. What's your favorite character? Ugh, oh, Ben Grimm the Thing. Right. And why is that? I don't know. It's just his personality and, like, you know, what happened to him. He was turned into a monster and it wasn't his fault. And I like him. And, and who's your fam favorite artist? Oh, Dave Cockrum. He does the X-Men. He's got to be my favorite. And Marvel comic? Yes. And who's your favorite character? Uh, uh, Avengers. I like Which one of the Avengers? Captain America. Captain America. And what's your favorite? The Falcon. Avengers. The Falcon? Yeah. Yeah, I like the Falcon a lot, too. Okay, how about you, young man? Come on through here. Are you having a good time today? Yeah. Yeah? And uh, do you read Marvel Comics? Yeah. Yeah? Who's your favorite character? Uh, Spider-Man or Iron Man. How come? Why do you like Spider-Man? Well, I don't know. I like his comics. He's, he's good. He's a good character, yeah. huh? Okay. Okay, what, what's your favorite character in Marvel Comics? The Hulk. The Hulk? Yeah. Why is that? Speak up. Well, I get a kick out of it. He's strange. He's different, you know, from other, other heroes. Mm -hmm. okay. And speaking of the Hulk, there he is. Now, he may not be flesh and blood, but this is the closest we were able to come to him in a short time. I want to tell you, he was one of the hits of the show. Whoever is inside of him sure did a great job. He didn't beat up more than a few kids. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Archie Goodwin, the new editor-in-chief at Marvel Comics. And we're here to interview him. Do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, what differences do you find uh, in working at Marvel? And how is it different from working at uh, Warren? Uh, chiefly, um, the difference in Marvel has always been Marvel has a much looser approach to comics. Uh, with Marvel's whole system of the writer doing a synopsis, sending it to the, uh, the artist to break it down, sending it back to the writer to dialogue the artist's picture, you get much more of a... Uh, a give and take, a sense of spontaneity, and even kind of a tension in the work, or the uh, the writer may not always know exactly what the artist is giving back, but then he takes it and goes with it. I think that's been Marvel's big asset, is uh, the spontaneity of method, the way Marvel works. Mr. Goodwin, I've seen scripts that you've written where you have thumbnail sketches of the entire page laid out on the back. Are you going to stop doing this, or are you going to keep on laying out the story for the artist. Occasionally we'll come up with a situation where we'll be using an artist who needs a script. Whenever I do a script, yes, I usually work that way. I try to uh, work it out in visual thumbnails myself to pace it, to find out where I'm going with it. I then give that to the artist, not as a, a rigid rule that this is the way it has to be done, but more as a suggestion of what my thinking is. So if it helps the artist, fine. Generally, I think artists feel like if they can see something visualized, I think it makes the artist feel a little more comfortable, even if it's something that they wind up not using. Right. A uh, question I'm sure many of our viewers will be interested in. Um, what do you think is the best way for an uh, aspiring artist or writer to break into professional comics? Probably uh, the first thing is I, I think you almost have to be in New York or able to come to, to New York constantly. You can send in work you can mail it in, and eventually we get around to looking at it. 
we can try to make some small criticism, but really the way to get in, you have to keep coming around, keep showing your work, trying to be available, getting to know people in comics. Uh, you really have to be terribly persistent. Uh, if, if a person isn't persistent, generally they, they probably will never make it in. But it, mostly it's persistence and availability, besides being damn good. Is it a, uh, a buyer's market now? Are there openings for artists? Right now, it's... For anyone, I should say, for anyone that's good, there's always a place. Uh, right now, I think, they're kind of trying to level out the number of titles on the newsstands and things like that, so that we seem to have hit a period when uh, there's not a terrific amount of work available, but, but still, anyone good, there's always a place for them. What about reprints? Are you going to cancel any? There are about five reprint titles now being considered for cancellation. We'll probably always do a certain number of reprints. In fact, a, a book like Marvel Tales, the Spider-Man reprint, uh, does almost as well as the original Spider-Man. There's, with comics you get you may have many long-term fans of a character, but you also get sort of a turnover readership where uh, every three years or so, you know, there'll be a new group of young fans coming up, other people will begin moving away, and somehow the old material, if they're interested in the character, is it's still of interest to them. So there will always be a certain number of reprints that we'll be doing because the demand is there. When you were at Warren, you were mostly writing um, horror and supernatural stories, not Marvel, but superheroes. Which type do you prefer? Or... Depends. Uh, after about six months of writing superheroes, uh, you know, you'd love to do a vampire story or something. After six months of doing vampires, uh, you know, you'd love to do a superhero story. Or at least that's the case with me. Are you going to take over Dracula? No, no. Marv Wolfman is uh, doing Dracula and doing a beautiful job on it. Um, he's been far more inventive with what I consider what would seem to be a limited character. He's worked out, I don't know, constant variations with it, and uh, he has incredible things coming up. Uh, no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it. Marv's doing a perfect job with it. As far what are you as going as to write? I'm not going to be writing anything. Uh, now that I've taken over Marvel's color books, I'm going to have my hands full. One, trying to get the books back on time. It's been an uphill battle ever since they began expanding. What do you mean back on time? Well, comics uh, have to be done on schedule. Uh, what we're finding is we're currently, because of the constant expansion of several years ago, uh, we generally run three weeks to a month behind the kind of schedules that printers and engravers could really be comfortable with. Like if you go too far behind on a printing or engraving uh, schedule, you'll miss the shipping date, which means your comic won't get out on the newsstand at its schedule time. So we've been getting hitting it just a little bit too close lately. And we're doing 40 titles a month, which is that's a lot of comics. So it, it's a considerable problem, but we are working on correcting that. So uh, it helps alleviate you know, any problems. Once in a while, if a book misses a shipping date, that's why you can't find an issue. Uh, why do you think there's so few women in the creative end of professional comics? The few who are there seem to be in the production aspect. Right. I think that will gradually change. I, I think, obviously, uh, with any kind of business, there's probably always been a certain amount of chauvinism involved. Uh, but also, comics have always traditionally be, been uh, more boy-oriented than girl-oriented, like... Male uh, fantasies. Yeah, yeah. And I think that will gradually change because there seem to be more female fans now. When they first started having comic conventions, uh, a girl was a rare sight at a comic convention. Uh, I see more and more girls and all, and, you know, I welcome it. And I think as a result of more girls being in fandom, more girls being interested in comics, there'll gradually be an influx of uh, female artists and female writers. Who's this to? Oh. And here, in the bicentennial year, what better superhero to meet than Marvel's own Captain America? Okay. Can I help you? Oh, just there, though. To this... okay. Lamont. Who's this to? Lamont. Lamont. How do you spell it? L-A-M-O-N-T? Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs>
And now, one of the most memorable highlights of the Marvel Con, the art lesson by Big John Buscema. Well, <laughs> I've been telling you for the longest time how great Big John is. Now you can see it for yourself. Right now, he was sketching Conan the Barbarian for a room full of wide-eyed and admiring youngsters. And I want to tell you, the way John draws, anybody would be wide-eyed and admiring. In fact, let me stop talking and just sit and watch him for a minute. And now, before we leave John, let me just tell you how you yourself can study under the master right here in his class in New York City. Those of you who'd like to learn to draw for comics or even to write for them, John Buscema, who was our guest last week, has started his own comic book workshop in which he personally and a staff of some of the most talented people around teach you to write and draw for comics. If you'd like information, and what red-blooded comic fan wouldn't, be sure to write to John Buscema, Department J, Box 394, East Setauket, New York, 11733. Hi. Here we are in the second annual Marvel Con convention at the Hotel Commodore, and I've got with me two fabulous dealers. On my right, we've got Mr. Art Gummis. Art Gummis. On my left, we have Tom Fagan. Tom Fagan. Two dealers who are going to answer some of those questions for you. Art, take it away. <laughs> no. What do you want to ask me? <laughs> well, tell me, is there profit in this? I mean, not profit, um, but do they really increase in price the way they say they do? Comic books increase in price. They do. About 20% a year. Now, someone least. was mentioning about, you mentioned, I think, earlier about Howard the Duck. Howard the Duck. Now, uh, this comic book right here came on sale about six months ago. Mm -hmm. And right now it's selling for four fifty to $6. And what was it selling for originally? 25 cents. 25 cents? Yes, the cover price is 25 cents. It's uh, gone up about, I think, about 100% a month since it's originally coming out. It beats inflation. It's a good investment. And it's very hard yeah. to find, too. It's still very hard to find. We, we sold out yesterday. We had 35 copies, and we sold out. All we have are number twos left. So there is a phenomenon for Howard the Duck. We can't keep in stock at any price. At any price. As a matter, as a matter <laughs> of fact, there's a Howard the Duck for President campaign going now by the uh, author, Steve Gerber the creator of Howard the Duck, uh, and uh, by Marvel Comics in general. And we have for you a oh, Howard the I Duck for President pin. You two have both had one. I've had none. I felt nude. I'm now a person. Howard the Duck. I'm campaigning. Yes. Now then, let's ask some questions. Do we have any original artwork here? Oh, sure. Or anything like oh, that? Do we have I'll get some also, while Art gets some, Tom, tell yeah. me, I hear that you two publish this Marvel Review yes. you're wearing. Yes, the Marvel let's Art Review. Let's have a good look at it. There it is, folks. Get you're a good look. Right? Marvel Review? Yes. Marvel Review. Right. Uh, big posters, yes. So, we, so we how did you two become publishers We it? noticed the lack of a, of a publication which would really get into defining what, what are good comics and the bad. People are always asking, you know, uh, how do I know which would be a good investment? Mm -hmm. so we got tired of answering people, so we decided to public t tell them in, in print. You know, tell this is good, this is bad. As long as, uh, as well as some very good in-depth articles on such characters as Howard in our first issue and Warlock in oh, our second. Warlock. Warlock came out of a cocoon. Uh -huh. Very interesting character. 
Oh, I think oh. Art is coming back with some original oh, art. Well, we've got some great stuff here. Really nice. And we have here... I have some goodies. Got it? This is the cover to the Marvel Art Review. Yeah. This is the cover right. to it the was, Marvel Right. It was drawn for us by Frank McLaughlin. It shows Howard the Duck surrounded by a, a bevy of beauties. And oh, there's the man, little Howard. There's little Howard on the, on the stump right there. He's reading his uh, magazine, Man Thing, at the time. And looming out of the shadows is Man Thing himself. Oh, it's beautiful. Now, what would the price be of this? Uh, this, I'd rather not say it's still the artist's uh, possession. Right. And I'm not sure if he even wants to sell it at all. I don't blame him. It's you. just here as promotional. Beautiful. Just before, what else do we have to say? Okay. Okay. Everyone by now is familiar with Stan's, or should be familiar or with. should be familiar with Stan's origin of uh, Marvel Comics. And there should be one in every second. library. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I have a preliminary cover sketch. Oh, let's see that. Ah, uh, John Romita, yes. our all-time favorite. This is a sign up of an original by John Now this Romita. one we have a price on, right? Right, this is $69. Aha, uh -huh. beautiful. A good number. Just beautiful. And is there... Uh, well, first of all, let me tell you what about Please. splash pages. Splash pages are the first page in a comic book, and they generally bring the most money. And I have a couple of excellent splash pages from Marvel here. Uh, this one is by John Basima, and it came from Savage Sword of Conan number 11. It's the opening page. It shows Conan on a horse, and it's a, a battle scene. Nice. That's a beautiful piece. Should I see another piece? Yes. We have a later splash from the. Uh, we have a later splash from the same, from the same comic book. Uh, I believe it was Sword and Sorcery number eleven. Savage Art. Sword of Savage Sword of Conan number eleven. Yes. This is a little bit further in the comic book. It shows our heroine in her Malini. usual predicament, Malini, trapped in a dungeon. Yes, yeah, about to be sold. And oh, all sorts it's beautiful. of. Beautiful. Yeah. Just, he does beautiful, and I hear John Buscema just opened up an art school that's teaching right. everyone how to do cartooning now, and has classes in session, right? We were selling his, um, well, I think it's graduated, and they published, they published a catalog of their artwork. Right, and we're students. John Buscema's students. Uh, workshop. And we sold it out. We have no more here. We sold it out yesterday. Really? Yes, it must have a few hours. That's fabulous. So the yes. students in the book and it was a sellout. Sellout, yes. We couldn't keep it here yesterday. So the students of John Buscema's class did a book, and it was a sellout on the first day, really. Right. That's just fabulous. Yes. 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 And everyone could get one of the common books and find out the forms, and they can attend to school right. and be part of the sellout, right? right? Uh, John's having courses on art, and uh, I think it's fabulous because it gets a lot of new talent into the business, and it really encourages the youngsters into getting into uh, creating artwork of this. And youngsters is what it's all about, right? right? Exactly. The Tell four-color world of Marvel is all about fun. Tell me, does read Marvel comic? Yes, a lot. Okay, what's your favorite character? Iron Man. How come? Because I just like uh, what he does. I think he's a great character. I like the uh, the stories that they write about him and uh, all the uh, the inventions. That well, he who's has. your who's your favorite writer? Uh, Stanley. But uh, uh, I also like uh, Steve Gerber because he has really great stories, unusual stories, not the usual cliches and that you usually see with a lot of comics. Well, you seem to be a pretty sophisticated comic book reader. How long have you been reading? For like five years now. I've collected thousands. Yeah? Of what, are the, what are the titles that you've collected? Spider-Man, Iron Man, Avengers, Fantastic Four, Hulk, uh, uh, Silver Surfer, um, everything. Uh, practically, uh, I, I try to collect some of every, every kind of title. Like. That's the name of the, of, of the store, really, the Super Snipe Comic Book Euphorium and Art Gallery, which has everything related to comics and a huge inventory of over 300,000 rare and new comics. Now, these include comics from 1934 to the present, including the Golden Age, plus a tremendous selection of original comic art. All new Marvel, DC, and other titles are sold at Super Snipe, often before they reach your local newsstand. The store is located at 1617 2nd Avenue, between 83rd and 84th Streets. It's open Tuesday through Saturday, 1230 to 530, and on Fridays till 7 o'clock. For a catalog, merely send 75 cents to Super Snipe, 1617 2nd Avenue, New York City, New York, 10028. And remember, Super Snipe buys complete collections. And now...
I want to talk to you about something else, something near and dear to my heart, namely my own little book, The Origins of Marvel Comics. Now, this book is for the people, the untold millions all over the world who, who want to know how did Marvel Comics start? Where did they come from? How did the first stories originate? Out of the goodness of my heart, I wrote this book, which has pictures and words and introductions and everything. It, um, it was followed immediately by a sequel called Son of Origins, which tells how the later Marvel comic strip started. It's really on very slick, beautiful paper, full color and so forth. And I would be happy to tell you how to obtain your copy. All you've got to do is send $6.95 to Simon & Schuster. They'll pay the postage and handling. That's $6.95 to Simon & Schuster, Department M.D., 630 5th Avenue, New York City, New York, 10020. Remember, write which book or books you prefer and how many copies. Print your name, address, and zip code clearly because we wouldn't want your book to fall into the wrong hands. Now... And here's Marvel's own genius editor-writer, Roy Thomas, telling about Marvel's many marvelous mistakes. The just made up. The best example, though, of somebody doing it and, and maybe making a little mistake, was, uh, I think was in uh, Stan's early X-Men. A very, to me, a very famous panel. One of the, uh, some of you will probably remember, as I used to, the issue number and the page and everything. But Professor Xavier runs this school for all these teenagers, right? And, you know, he's, okay, he's, he's supposed to be fairly young himself, but still, you know, he's bald and everything, you know, and he, he doesn't look all that young. And he, he looks kind of old and decrepit somehow, despite the fact he's not supposed to be that much older than the X-Men. And, and the thing is, Stan and most of the Marvel books, uh, you know, are, they just, they're just full of thought balloons. That's how we get a lot of thoughts across, thought balloons all over the place. Uh, and... Stan, you know, had an empty space he wanted to fill up in this one panel, in this one story. And, he, and I guess it just, I don't know, it just occurred to him there should be a thought balloon coming from uh, Professor Xavier while all the X-Men are just standing around there doing nothing except talking to each other. And Professor Xavier's just sitting there. He couldn't have him do nothing. So he put this uh, thought balloon, I, I don't, can't quote exactly, but of course it's referring to Jean Grey, who's, the, uh, who's Marvel Girl. This is in one of the very earliest issues, and it says, uh, Oh, Gene, my darling, you know, if only you knew how I love you, you know. And that, never again, you know, he wrote like 20 issues that book. Never again did Professor Xavier ever express any prurient interest in Gene Gray. Just, I think Stan just wrote it in there to fill the space, and he forgot it. Now, if he wanted to, he could have made something out of this, but, you know, he just, he just left it in there. And, and uh, once in a while we do this, so if you see a balloon sometime, you know, it, it may have just been what they call Homer nodding, which means that the writer fell asleep and wrote something and then later forgot to correct it. <laughs> Uh, I once wrote a thing about, there's the, there's the doorbell, and the sound effect was knock knock, I remember, you know. That's <laughs> true. But my, my favorite example, though, in seeing the artwork, and, and you know, just, you know, like, being a little crass and forgetting to proofread something, was when I, uh, uh, had, it was in the X-Men also, and, uh, the Beast was handing, was being handed a tool by Marvel Girl, I think it was like a, uh, a pliers, and she says, uh, and the, the line I wrote was, uh, here's the screwdriver you wanted, and, uh, I, I thought it was just a mistake and so forth, and I prepared for the usual letters, but one person defended me and said that uh, it just proved that I, you know, I, it was just like a swipe at women, you see, saying that they didn't know the difference between a pliers and a screwdriver, <laughs> and the actual one who made the mistake uh, was me. I, I do know, but I just, you know, wasn't paying attention. I don't know how these things happen. But... And now, going from the <laughs> cultural to the chaotic, we had our very own karate kung fu exhibition there at the Marvel Con. Captain America with the contest winners from the costume parade we had earlier this afternoon. I'm Captain America. Who are you? 
The Gremlin. And who are you? I'm Iron Man. Okay, these are the two first place winners. Are you a hero or are you a bad guy? I'm a hero. Who's your worst enemy? My worst enemy, I suppose, is the Yellow Claw now. Okay, is, are you a hero or are you an enemy? An enemy. Ah, uh, who's the superhero that you fight the most? The Hulk. The uh, Hulk, did you see him downstairs? Yep. Did you suppose he voted for you? I hope so. <laughs> okay, number the second place man. These two gentlemen were tied for first place. The second place man is? Hate Monger. Okay, Hate Monger, who are you? Are, are you a superhero or are you a super enemy? I'm a super enemy. And who is the hero that you fight most of the time? Well, it's between S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Fantastic Four. Uh and that's it, the Marvel Con 1976. Be with us again next week for an actual art lesson with John Buscema. Thanks and good night. Excelsior. Spider-Man is now very big in the rock music field because Life Song Records have just put out an album called Spider-Man, Rock Reflections of a Superhero. And believe it or not, we have the Silver Surfer on the keyboards, the background vocals by Fantastic Four, Captain America on percussion, and so forth and so forth. Their pictures are all on the back. And I'd like to tell you how to get this album also. If um, you will just send your name and address and zip code to Superhero Merchandise, Post Office Box 777, Dover, New Jersey, 07801. The album itself is 737, and the cassette, or an 8-track cassette, is 837. So just send the right amount of money to the address mentioned, and you can hear songs like No One Has a Crush on Peter, Count on Me, Gwendolyn, and so forth. It's really real rock for the older listener.